tonight on Nova. He is alive against the odds. He has broken all the rules of people infected with HIV and sparked a new approach to fighting the disease. These people are heroes. We found a group of individuals who are willing to put the greater cause over their own well-being. Patients like these are on the front lines of bold new research. Could understanding them be the key to surviving AIDS? Princeton University, the annual celebration of class reunions. As far back as the class of 1923, men and women who have survived decades gather to reminisce, see old friends, and catch up. But in the class of 78, there's one man no one expected to be here. The year he graduated, Bob Massey was infected with HIV, the AIDS virus. A hemophiliac, he got HIV from contaminated blood clotting factor. At the time, it was a death sentence. People would say, HIV is a fatal illness, although you can go as long as blank years before you fall ill. And the blank was always whatever number it had been for me. So when people would say, we can go as long as five years, and I was five years out, and then you can go as long as seven years, and I was seven years out. You can, some people can go as long as 10 years, and I was 10 years out. So there's always this sense that I was right sort of at the limit. But against all odds, Massey, an Episcopalian minister, has stayed completely healthy. His survival both a miracle and a mystery, is inspiring a whole new approach to fighting AIDS. There are people walking around, and Bob Massey is an example, who have been infected for almost 20 years, and they're doing incredibly well. If we can understand what's going on in them, we may be able to take that, in, that knowledge uh, and use it to our benefit in people who presently aren't controlling the virus. In labs and hospitals across the country, there are bold new experiments going on as researchers step into the unknown and patients put their lives on the line. These adopted twins are infected with HIV. At two months old, they were the youngest patients ever to be given powerful anti-AIDS drugs. No one knows what their future will hold. If we run out of drug therapy, then they might say someday, oh, we shouldn't have used all our drugs in the beginning. And if you get to that point, then it's too late. Other patients are volunteering to stop those same life-saving drugs to see if survival is possible without them. These people are heroes. Whatever information we can glean, we found a group of individuals who are willing to put the greater cause over their own, potentially over their own well-being. The courage of a few individuals may open the door for millions of AIDS victims. And this era of new hope has come not a moment too soon. With the epidemic well into its second decade, the National AIDS Memorial Quilt has become an all too familiar symbol of the 500,000 Americans and 11 million people worldwide who have succumbed to AIDS. What's hard is living with the continuous grief. You kept losing people every year, six people, seven people. Last week, a friend of mine's obit was in the paper. It's not easy when you're losing friends and you're that young and it goes on for such a long period of time and the only thing you could compare it to would be to be in a war. The war began when the AIDS virus was discovered in 1984. It is one of the most formidable enemies science has ever faced. There are still many, many mysteries about how the body reacts to 
protects itself against or suppresses HIV uh, that are unanswered. And one of the reasons why they're unanswered is that we're dealing with such a unique virus. The AIDS virus is unique in part because it attacks the immune system, the very cells in the body designed to fight off invaders. Carried through the bloodstream, the virus injects its genes into the immune cells of its victim. Each infected cell becomes a breeding ground for the deadly HIV virus. Slowly but relentlessly, the immune system is destroyed. Many of these scientists have dedicated the past 15 years to AIDS research, especially the struggle to come up with a protective vaccine. From the very first moment that the virus was discovered, a vaccine was on people's minds. Um, and there has been a significant effort to make a vaccine from the very first day. And I think people thought it would be simple because we'd made vaccines for so many different viruses. But HIV belongs to a particularly devious family called retroviruses. There has never been a successful vaccine against a retrovirus. And many scientists are beginning to believe that a vaccine against AIDS may be impossible to make and too dangerous to test. If you take it and then a year goes by and everybody's fine, then you say, okay, that's good, now let's give it to uh, 500 people and then a year goes by and everything's fine. You say, well, then now let's give it to thousands of people and then you find out that it takes 12 years for all hell to break loose and then what have you done? It's been an enormous struggle because the obvious things didn't work and people uh, got very frustrated by that. And then the next question was, where do you turn? What's not obvious? What can we do? It's a question that takes on special urgency at places like this, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, a leading center for AIDS treatment and research. This lab was the first to show that combinations of antiviral drugs, the AIDS cocktails, could prolong life for many patients. The first real ray of hope in the epidemic. Now scientists here are looking for the next breakthrough. I think if you go back five to ten years, the entire emphasis was on trying to develop drugs that could be given to patients to make them better. What's changed dramatically is that we've, we've slowly gotten a sense that there may be another factor that, that may be able to contribute to people doing better, and, and that's the immune system. That's the body's natural defenses against viruses. It was 1994 when Bruce Walker met the patient who would help turn his thinking toward the immune system, Bob Massey. I didn't know what to expect. And he came in and he was such a, a friendly and interested fellow. And when we started to describe what my situation was, and he looked at some of the numbers that uh, had come back or that I'd brought with me, he was um, so excited and so enthusiastic that it was actually quite charming. <laughs> he came in and said, I've been infected for 16 years, but I feel great. I've never taken any drugs. Uh, we thought that was already interesting, but when we got his viral load back, we became incredibly interested. Lab tests showed that Massey did have antibodies against HIV in his blood, proof he was infected. But to Walker's surprise, the virus was not multiplying wildly the way it normally did. What we have here is a viral load assay which measures the amount of HIV RNA in the patient's blood. This is a patient that has acute HIV infection. And you can see the yellow color goes all the way down to the final dilution here. There's a very high amount of virus in this patient's blood, greater than a million copies. And this last well here is Bob Massey. And you, he has no yellow color at all and has undetectable viral load. Without any drugs to control the virus, Massey's natural immune defenses seem to be holding HIV in check, an unheard of idea. Walker and his colleague, Dr. Eric Rosenberg, embarked on a quest to unravel this mystery. They began at the most basic level of immune response, 
two sets of white blood cells called CD4 helper T cells and CD8 killer T cells. CD4 helper cells are the first line of defense against any invading virus. They send chemical signals to the rest of the immune system to begin an attack. When summoned, CD8 killer cells marshal their forces and eradicate the virus. But HIV overwhelms the helper cells before they can sound the alarm. That leaves the killer cells without direction, helpless against HIV. So where is this sample going? This sample is going back to the, the Mass General, and then there are several different investigators who have experiments that they want to do within our lab. So when Eric Rosenberg and Bruce Walker started analyzing Bob Massey's blood, they discovered something amazing. His killer cells were doing exactly what they were supposed to do. We had developed a theory already that killer cells were an important component of an effective immune response. And so we, we looked in Bob to see if he had killer cells present. And what we found was that n not only did he have killer cells present, but he had enormous numbers of killer cells. Once Walker knew that Massey's killer cells were working, the next question was, how was that possible if his helper cells had been destroyed by HIV? The answer was a complete surprise. Somehow, Bob Massey's helper cells had escaped the virus and were leading an incredibly strong immune response. Not only did he have a helper cell response to HIV, but he had a phenomenal, uh, a phenomenally large helper cell response. We were all amazed that we thought that this, that people who were HIV infected just didn't, weren't able to mount this type of immune response, and here was somebody who clearly did, and did it in a way that uh, was never seen before. Massey was breaking all the rules. His natural immune defenses were keeping HIV under control. He's called a long-term non-progressor, and he's not the only one. About 5% of people infected with HIV are surviving for years without illness. Understanding these patients could be crucial to saving millions of people who would otherwise die of AIDS. Up until now, the best available therapy for controlling HIV in this country has been combinations of powerful drugs that stop the virus from multiplying in the body. All right. So have you noticed any difference in any of this since I last saw you? No, I haven't. The AIDS cocktails have kept many patients alive much longer than would have been imaginable at the beginning of the epidemic. But as they are more and more widely used, life-threatening side effects that no one expected are developing, like diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. The side effects that we fear the most, obviously, are those kinds of side effects that affect internal organs and can make people quite ill or, or cause them to be admitted to the hospital. And it's possible that long-term side effects of these drugs will turn out to be worse than we anticipated. And I think patients are extremely aware of that risk. The cocktail drugs are also enormously expensive, an average of $15,000 a year per patient. And almost half the patients who try cocktail therapy do not get better. They develop resistance to the drugs, or the drugs simply don't work. For those of us that take care of patients, we're coming to the unhappy realization that for many patients, these drugs are failing, and we're left without a whole lot of other options. In the face of this hard reality, the stakes are high as the Mass General team struggles to unlock the secrets of Bob Massey's remarkable survival. I began to see the significance of some of these things when Eric would arrive and he would jokingly refer to me as the gold standard. He'd say, I'm, I need to draw a little more from the gold standard. I said at one point, my code name uh, you know, in the research was 161J, I learned this. And I thought, well, you know, the irony is that all the other things I'm doing in my life, 
books and other activities and uh, I may end up being more well known as 161J than anything else. <laughs> it is only now, 20 years into the epidemic, that scientists are grasping the significance of that small group of people who break the rules of AIDS infection. One of them is Steve Crone, a witness to the earliest days of the epidemic in a very personal way. In January 1978, Jerry Green, my partner, became sick with flu-like symptoms. And that continued for a while. Jerry's progression of his disease went on for 15 months, in which time he suffered a number of debilitating, wasting, he went blind in one eye, uh, he had cytomegalovirus. When he actually passed on March 4th, 1982, there was no such disease as what we call AIDS. But in fact, Crohn's partner was one of the first deaths from AIDS in the US. When the HIV virus was discovered in 1984, Crone worried that he'd been infected. There was always this underlying suspicion that sooner or later, it might find its way into my system. And n not because I had a lived, lived a very promiscuous lifestyle, but just because there was something out there that was invisible, that was transmissible by blood products or human or vaginal juices, whatever, and that you were I exposed. And there are a lot of people that don't know how to take care of themselves. But despite repeated exposures to HIV, Steve Crone remained uninfected. I don't know why I was surviving. I remember talking about it with somebody at a family party, and they said, well, why aren't they studying you? Like when you look at families and the ch all the children have some malfunction or bone disorder, or some genetic disease or whatever, they, ch they study the child that is not. And most of the studies were not studying HIV-negative people at all. Crone volunteered for a study at the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center in New York. Dr. David Ho, a pioneer in anti-AIDS cocktail therapy, is now looking for new ways to attack HIV by studying people who have resisted infection. I think we, we have uh, learned in science that by studying outliers, the extreme result here and there, you could really learn a great deal about what is happening in the normal situation. Ho took cells from Steve Crone's blood and flooded them with HIV in test tubes. He and one other person turned out to have cells that were resistant to HIV infection, while the cells of others were readily susceptible to HIV infection in the test tube. And initially, we thought that was a, a mistake in, in experimentation. But upon repeated testing, it, it gave us the consistent result that their cells were resistant to the prevalent strains of uh, HIV-1. If Ho could figure out why Steve Crone was immune to HIV, the potential was obvious. A way to protect millions of people against AIDS. HIV infects the immune system by binding to protein receptors on the surface of CD4 helper cells. One type of receptor was identified, but it was not enough. Binding to this receptor alone would not allow HIV to penetrate the cell. Perhaps a second receptor was needed, but it would take more than 10 years for scientists to find it. When they finally did, in an explosion of discovery, five different labs, including David Ho's group in New York, announced they had isolated the second receptor for HIV, called CCR5. For HIV to penetrate into a cell, it, it needs to have a dual docking uh, mechanism at the, at the surface of the cell. So HIV uh, will use its own protein, the outer protein, to bind to two different cellular molecules. And HIV will bind to CD4 first, it then changes its structure after binding to CD4, and therefore the new structure would then bind to CCR5, and that would cause the two membranes to fuse, and then 
HIV then enters the cell. Since the CCR5 receptor is a protein, and proteins are produced by genes, the next question was whether there might be a genetic reason why some people did not get infected by HIV. The role of genes in the AIDS epidemic is the focus of the Laboratory of Genomic Diversity at the National Cancer Institute. Human genetics is traditionally thought to involve uh, hereditary diseases that we inherit from our parents, but there's something of the order of two or three million genetic differences between every individual of the human race. And those differences affect a lot more than hereditary diseases. They also affect our appearance, our behavior, uh, our immune response, uh, how quickly our hair goes gray, whether it falls out, and how fat we get. And one of the things it also affects is the heterogeneity uh, in the context of how we respond to pathogenic or fatal infectious diseases. O'Brien's lab had been collecting blood samples for over 10 years, looking for some genetic pattern in the way people respond to AIDS. The lab has more than 10,000 samples under analysis. These are viably frozen cells from a patient. They're immortalized lymphocytes. We can take them out anytime we want, thaw them and grow them, and get more DNA if we need to, or do immunological experiments. And from this, we're able to do virtually any experiment that we would like to do on these cells, which are as viable as if we just took them from the patient. Finally, one of those samples revealed an amazing secret. Some people who'd been exposed to HIV but were not infected were missing the gene responsible for the CCR5 receptor. Without that gene, they produced a defective form of CCR5 that never got expressed on the surface of their immune cells. If you don't make a proper CCR5 gene, there is no CCR5 produced on the surface of his T cells or macrophages. And if that happens when they're exposed to HIV, it simply doesn't get in because the door's shut. They absolutely require the CCR5 molecule in order to enter these cells. One of the first samples with the missing CCR5 gene came from Steve Crone. So for me, it's like a key. The virus comes with this. If you're looking for a two-hole keyhole, I don't have one of the holes. Period. It's never going to attach to me. Steve Crone's natural immunity to HIV is rare, but it has been found in other people. And that really it was a natural genetic solution to a fatal retroviral disease. And it was even more alluring because it turned out that patients who had two copies of this variant allele, those that were resistant to infection, were actually quite healthy. They, many of them had no immunological disease or any problems associated with this genetic variant. In fact, this genetic variant wasn't a disease, it was a benefit. The fact that some individuals could live without CCR5 suggests that that particular uh, molecule is a good target since it's dispensable. And so we could develop drugs that would attack CCR5 without the fear that it was absolutely essential for some uh, for survival of that host. The grand but so far elusive payoff of the CCR5 discovery would be an AIDS vaccine. We don't know precisely how to use the new understanding to apply to vaccine development today. But as you could see, vaccine development is, is generally aimed at protecting the cell from becoming infected or generally protecting the individual from becoming infected and something that works at the surface in preventing HIV to penetrate into the cell would be crucial and this knowledge um, is an important part of that but how to exploit it is currently unclear. I don't want to rip this quilt. For Steve Crone, a future free from HIV infection is assured. Yeah. And his genetic stroke of luck, he hopes, will be part of helping others survive AIDS. I would like to still be able to make a contribution to whatever research is going out there. If this blood supply, if you know the, the testing and the research 
if I can be involved in that in some way that makes a contribution, I'm here for that. The CCR5 mutation is not what's protecting Bob Massey. His cellular receptors are normal. What's keeping him healthy is still a mystery. You know, there's sort of two pieces of this. One is they want to take what they've learned from studying my immune system and apply it to others, and that's a wonderful piece. I also hope that they eventually figure out why this happened in me, because they still don't really know that. It's, um, that's the great mystery. Okay, thanks very much. Bye. In the course of unraveling that mystery, Bruce Walker has picked up some clues about how to turn ordinary HIV patients into long-term non-progressors. From studying Massey's immune system, Walker suspects that whatever is keeping him healthy can be traced back to the earliest days of his infection, before the AIDS virus could destroy his helper T cells. So we thought that, that actually we could test that hypothesis. And the way we could test that would be to find somebody who had just become infected, immediately treat them with highly active antiviral therapy, so as to protect these helper cells as they were being generated, to protect them from becoming infected themselves. And if you can get somebody through that period and have that immune response develop normally, we think they may have the appropriate tools to, to move forward and keep the virus under control. Walker and Rosenberg came up with a completely novel idea. Find patients who had just been infected and try to rescue their immune systems. Can I come in? How are you? Good to see you. Do it again. Push on my hand. Push. In the early years of the epidemic, doctors believed that HIV infected silently, without any symptoms. I'm just gonna but studies revealed just the opposite. Most people get very sick when first infected, with high fever, sore throat, swollen glands, and other symptoms. But they recover, and they brush it off as a bad case of the flu. All right, ready? These symptoms are called acute retroviral syndrome, the body's reaction to the explosion of HIV in the blood when it first gains a foothold. AIDS Action Hotline, can I help you? Working with doctors and hotlines across Boston, Walker's team set out to find patients who had just been infected before they developed antibodies, the telltale signs of HIV infection or even had an AIDS test. Second, do you, do you feel you might have been put at risk recently or this is a checkup? But Eric Rosenberg, moonlighting at the Mass General Clinic, found their first patient. His name is Mike Burns. I first came down with a really, really serious fever. Um, I think the temperature was 105 or 104 um, and I was just burning, burning up. Rosenberg was particularly alarmed by an unusual rash on Mike Burns' body. I was so impressed with his rash that I went to find one of our medical students who was rotating through the walk-in clinic to look at the rash. And when I got back in the room, Mike actually had new lesions. He had one new lesion on his abdomen that I hadn't seen prior five minutes before walking out of the room. It was a tricky diagnosis. A rash like Mike Burns had is sometimes, but not always, a symptom of acute retroviral syndrome. What Eric did was to ask the crucial question, which was, had this person potentially been exposed to somebody who might be HIV infected? And the answer to that question was, in fact, yes, he had had unprotected sex with somebody uh, whose HIV status he didn't know uh, in, the, in the preceding uh, two to three weeks. It was so early that antibodies to HIV wouldn't have developed yet. A conventional AIDS test would be negative. 
But if the virus were there, it could be measured. His viral load, when we initially tested it, was 1.2 million copies per milliliter of blood. The viral load test in our hospital only goes up to 750,000 copies, and we actually had to dilute it out to get to the true number of virus with Mike. So it was off scale. A series of blood tests left no doubt. The virus had already devastated Mike Burns' helper T cells. When we did the initial analysis the first day that we saw him, it, there were no helper cells present. That, in fact, made sense to us because there's so much virus around that we thought, if any are there, they're being uh, infected and eliminated as soon as they are getting generated. Walker and his collaborator, Dr. Paul Sachs, put Mike Burns on an aggressive combination of anti-AIDS drugs. Deep breath. And out. And again. He is the first patient to take these drugs early in infection in the hope that they will rescue his helper T cells and allow his immune system to function in the same way that is keeping Bob Massey healthy. My understanding is that the hit early, hit hard uh, philosophy is one to allow the immune system not to get ravaged in the first place and by giving my immune system some outside assistance with all these drugs that I have to take um, that we are affording my immune system the time to uh, prepare its own defense against the uh, virus. Patients like Mike Burns find themselves at the cutting edge of clinical AIDS research where there are many unanswered questions. Will early drug treatment really save the immune system? Could early use of these drugs make patients resistant to them? And will there be harmful side effects? Well, I can't worry about it. Um, it's uh, part of the uncertainty that I have to face in life. Uh, it's very real. Uh, but I don't worry about it because basically I know that this is the right thing to do. And if I do have some of these other things come up, we'll deal with them one at a time. Every step forward in AIDS research is accompanied by risk. And the stakes are never higher than when children are involved. Twin brother and sister Caroline and Jeffrey are three years old. Their adoptive parents are Gail and Alan. It's a good thing we have two chairs, huh, Caroline? Jeffrey's more of the definitely a man's man, aggressive and pushy, and, and Caroline is the uh, little princess of the family. Mommy, snatch it. They're both very friendly, active, busy. Just get into trouble if you're not keeping your eye on them all the time. On the day Gail and Alan picked the children up for their adoption, they learned that their mother was infected with HIV. We did talk about things like, you know, somebody's got to love them, might as well be us. And I remember us, tears running down our cheeks in church when we looked at them, because I think we just didn't expect to be able to keep them. I guess my impression is we were going to be taking care of some babies for a while and they probably wouldn't survive into childhood. And so I thought that that would be just a sort of a small sacrifice for us to do for a few years. And then... Uh, I was even wondering if we should be saving up for their funeral. Yeah. Life expectancy for the twins, who soon tested positive for HIV, was no better than a couple of years. There's a very major difference between infants who are infected with HIV and adults. Infants who are infected at birth, most of them would develop symptoms compatible with AIDS in the first two years of life, whereas in an adult, it took approximately 10 years. You know who works here? This is where Dr. Lazuriaga works, and Josie. Yeah. At the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, the first experimental study in the country of aggressive drug therapy for children is designed to help their delicate immune systems fight back. Straight ahead at mommy. The study is modeled after Bruce Walker's research on adult patients in early infection. 
you. You were so good. Uh, we had designed this trial um, precisely with the hypothesis that with early therapy, we could limit viral replication and preserve children's immune systems, allow them long-term survival with intact immune systems. All right, Jeffrey, let's take a listen here. At two months of age, the twins started taking modified doses of the same anti-AIDS drugs given to adults. These drugs had never before been used in children so young. Gail starts the twins' medication first thing in the morning. Well, we start around 7 or 8, and we give them uh, a mixture of ice cream and powder. me. Hmm? No. And then I wait about 45 minutes, an hour, and I give them a syringe full of medicine. And then another half hour, I give them another syringe. And then around 3 or 4 o'clock, we give them another ice cream medicine with powder. And then around 8.30 at night, we do... Um, another syringe at 9.30 we do another syringe and at 11 o'clock at night, 11.30 we do another ice cream and powder. We wake them up, we pick them up out of bed and we carry them in and we spoon it into their mouths and give them some water so their teeth will be somewhat clean and put them back to bed. Bye. The hope was that these drugs would keep the virus from destroying the twins developing immune systems and it seemed to work well. The children dropped from viral loads of over 400,000 to undetectable levels until they were just over a year old. About 16 months uh, into the therapy, uh, they came in for a routine visit and uh, we, got, we took the bloods and uh, a guy who does the RNA in our lab called us in and said, I'm getting a signal. Jeffrey's HIV had broken through the drugs and was starting to multiply. Both twins were immediately switched to a more powerful cocktail. Now their blood is tested every two months. Breathe in, Jeff. Breathe in. Good boy. Good boy. Oh, you are so good, Jeff. Great. Look at Danny. Good boy. I know, sweetheart. I'm sorry. Today, the twins are as healthy as any other children. Recent tests on their blood using the most sensitive methods available cannot detect any active virus, and their helper and killer cells are normal. They're uh, three years and four months of age, and their immune systems are completely normal. If you looked at these children, you would not be able to tell that they were HIV infected. But the children still have HIV genes in their blood cells. And no one knows the long-term effects of the drugs they are taking. When they first started the treatment, there was no uh, cocktail. It wasn't the prescribed treatment. Uh, people were experimenting. And so Jeffrey and Caroline had experimentation. Uh, and I really feel blessed that uh, they've been as fortunate as they have. It's great that they're they're at this front line and that they've been this successful. But there's lots of ifs. It's still so much unknown. We're, we're right there with the first group of people learning that there's still some bad news that we could learn. Where's the face? Where's the face? How are you? <laughs> Mike Burns has now been on anti-AIDS drugs for two years, from the very start of his infection. Uh, he recovered spontaneously from that illness. And also, he's gone on and taken his medicines more successfully than almost any other person I know, and has done remarkably well. I was asked this trick question. How many doses have you missed in the last couple Nine. of weeks? Nine. I do not <laughs> miss doses. You know that. You're a model. Um, Within no. a few weeks of starting therapy, Burns' viral load dropped from over one million to below detectable levels. But what is even more exciting for Walker is that catching Burns early seems to have had a significant effect on his helper cells. As we continued to treat him, what we saw was the gradual development of a strong helper cell response that, in fact, has been persistent to this day. Walker has now studied 20 patients like Burns, and unlike patients who begin therapy later in the course of infection, they have all developed strong immune responses.
So this is an absolutely predictable response uh, if one treats people early. These people then generate the kinds of immune responses that we, that we otherwise see in long-term non-progressors. But to advance to the next level, Walker and his team will have to take an even more dramatic and more risky step. Hi, how are you doing? Should we take a look at uh, yeah. some of the stuff? Um, the critical experiment that I think has to be done is to stop therapy on some of these individuals that have these exuberant immune responses to, to be able to say whether or not this is enough of an immune response. The patient who's volunteered to be the first to stop therapy is John Sarevsky. The very first, I, I was a little bit scared. I mean, I used to work for the Milwaukee AIDS Project, and, and watching guys pretty much go downhill right before my eyes would, um, you know, flash before in my memory. But even now, I'm not really focusing on, on what possible dangers lie ahead. Um, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. Within weeks of infection, John started taking 14 pills a day. I took um, two of these three times a day, two of these three times a day. And one, one of these twice a day. Um, yeah, that's, that's one day. Uh, and I and did that every day for the past uh, year and a half now. So this was right when he, this was pre-therapy? Yes. Okay. And Before Bruce Walker embarked on this experiment, he wanted to make sure that John's immune response was strong. Right. One critical test would show if John's killer cells could recognize and destroy HIV. Each one of these wells contains John's killer cells and HIV. A special dye is added, and if the killer cells are working, they will turn color. It's actually very exciting because you don't know. You do the assay, you put in the cells, and, and you don't know what you'll see. And at the last step over a two-day experiment, you put the colorizer on, and then you just kind of sit there and watch. And the first time we saw these, uh, you know, in our patients, since we didn't know what to expect, we were really excited to see them because each spot represents theoretically one HIV recognizing cell. The little purple dots reveal that John's killer cells are functioning well. So it's encouraging, but uh, let's hope it's enough. Right, yeah. right. But will they continue to work um, when the drugs are withdrawn? Right, right. Anyway, so let's August 1998. Uh, again, the time has come for John and everyone else to um, find out. Basically, what, what we need to have you do is, is sign a consent form, and what this does... I guess I'm the first one, and I think... I think it's the right way to go. I pretty much trust uh, Eric that if there are signs of danger, I'll hear about it pretty much, probably pretty much before my body will tell me. Um, and, uh, and just kind of go with his direction on that one. When you this is a critical moment. With the first time that an early intervention patient will stop taking the drugs that have been keeping AIDS at bay. And Walker knows that other labs have tried taking later stage patients off therapy with disastrous results. Not only did HIV come back in full force, but some patients developed resistance to the medications. That is a distinct risk for John as well. There's a possibility that when the virus comes back, it may be less susceptible to the drugs that, that we're giving you. We think that that will not be the case, but again, we, we can't guarantee that. And, uh, I think every physician taking care of a patient feels a, a personal responsibility. There are uh, sleepless nights when one undertakes some of these things and one worries about, uh, about what the outcome is. We obviously try as hard as we can to design things in such a way that, that the risk to patients is, is absolutely minimal. But one can never be absolutely 
certain. I mean, no, one can never guarantee no risk in, in these sorts of trials. Uh, so you sign right there. I, I think that the responsibility is much greater than I ever anticipated because we have people who are really going into the unknown and we're asking them to do it. And so I think it has been a big responsibility, but if you go into the unknown with them and you admit that you don't know what's going to happen, but you think that the, the risk is, there's a, there's a present risk, but that it's not a risk that is tremendously great, and the benefit can be huge, I think that it's one of those things where the, the benefit can outweigh the risk, and that's what we're hoping for. In the 20 years that he's been infected, Bob Massey has also had to learn to live with risk. His two sons were born before it was clear that HIV could be transmitted between husband and wife, or to infants during birth. But perhaps because Bob's viral load was so low, neither the boys nor their mother were infected. Still, the emotional toll of an incurable disease, the hard reality of AIDS, hangs over him every day. Doctors don't ever say things with certainty. They use the language of probability. And so, in my case, it's gone from being certain that I would fall ill to possible to unlikely. Um, I would like it to get to the highest degree of certainty possible. I would like somebody to be able to say, you have completely suppressed the virus. You have permanently suppressed the virus. Um, I would like someone to say, um, there is absolutely zero risk for you and your wife. Um, now they say infinitesimally small but we still practice safe sex and we still think about it. And it would be very nice to have somebody say, guess what, you don't have to do that anymore. Massey may never have that certainty, but he does have an important role in AIDS research. It's great that it's helpful to other people. And I think that that helps a lot dealing with the fact that he's not sick because to just escape um, and leave everybody behind in a way is, I think, harder to deal with. To feel that at least your good health isn't just your private victory. It's really something that can help other people, makes it make a lot more sense. But the experiment modeled on Bob Massey, with John Sarafsky, its first volunteer, got off to a disappointing start. After John stopped the medication, he felt fine for a number of weeks. His viral load stayed below the limits of detection for about the first three weeks. Then John got strep throat, and it lingered. In the lab, Rosenberg saw his viral load start to climb from 100 to 800 to 1,200, and finally up to 17,000. He and Walker had to put John back on his heavy dose of drugs. I think even though on the outside he, he, was, he didn't want to admit it, I think that he was scared and that he very much wanted this to succeed. Within two weeks of resuming therapy, John's viral load fell, returning to undetectable levels. That was a good sign. His virus had probably not become resistant to the drugs while he was off them. And there were signs that his immune system was rallying to fight off HIV, a strong increase in his CD8 killer T cells. I think what we have here is not a virus that roared back, but a virus that crept back. And so I think we have a, a suggestion that the immune system actually may have been trying to do something to the virus as it was coming back. Um, and, yet, and yet there wasn't enough of it, it wasn't effective enough to, to really keep things uh, completely suppressed. That's the, the optimistic view at this point. Carefully and critically, Walker and Rosenberg will analyze what happened to John. Then they will try the same experiment again with other patients. 
and perhaps with him. It's kind of what we expected to happen, but not what we hoped. I, I figure we'll, we'll try it again. I, if, it, if not in this study, you know, it'll be, there'll be another one. If it's not me, it'll be somebody else. It'll, I guess, in a sense, um, ever bringing us closer to possibly finding a cure or some way to make this more manageable, maybe like hepatitis or hope, you know, hopefully as minimal as even chicken box, where you just don't have to worry about it any longer. As patients and scientists continue to put themselves on the front lines of AIDS research, no one can really predict what the outcome will be. The goal is to turn every AIDS patient into a long-term survivor. I think the long-term non-progressors provide hope. Uh, they provide hope to the patients that uh, HIV is not universally lethal. They provide hope to the scientists who are working to develop ways to control HIV. As we follow these people longer and longer and we see more and more examples of individuals now out 20 years who still have an undetectable viral load, I think the likelihood is that some of these people will die of otherwise natural causes and not as a result of their HIV infection. Bob Massey, the man who inspired this line of research, gathers with his family and friends to mark a special occasion, the baptism of his new daughter, Kate. There was some risk that Bob's new wife, Anne, might become infected by getting pregnant. But with Bob's viral load undetectable, the couple decided it was a risk worth taking. And Anne and Kate are both fine. Catherine, Suzanne, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have such a tremendous sense of gratitude when I look at my children, I think. Uh, this was a totally unexpected free gift. And what that produces in me is a, a desire to um, be worthy of that gift and to give back to those around me, my family, and more broadly, something that, that can express how wonderful a gift that is. What Massey offers is a clue to solving the mystery of the most dreaded disease of our time. His gift may someday turn out to be the key to surviving AIDS. How close are we to an AIDS vaccine? Get an update on NOVA's website at www.pbs.org. To order the show for 1995, plus shipping and handling, call 1-800-255-9424. And to learn more about how science can solve the mysteries of our world, ask about our many other NOVA videos. NOVA is a production of WGBH Boston.